Chapter Sixteen, Part Four of A Diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A Diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter Sixteen, Richmond, Virginia, Part Four. February fifth, when Lawrence handed me my husband's money, six hundred dollars it was. I said. Now I am pretty sure you do not mean to go to the Yankees, for with that pile of money in your hands you must have known there was your chance. He grinned, but said nothing. At the President's reception, Hood had a perfect ovation. General Preston navigated him through the crowd, handling him as tenderly, on his crutches, as if he were the Princess of Wales's newborn baby that I read of today. It is bad for the head of an army to be so helpless. But old Blucher went to Waterloo in a carriage, wearing a bonnet on his head to shade his inflamed eyes, a heroic figure, truly, an old, red-eyed, bonneted woman, apparently, back in a landau. And yet, Blucher to the rescue! Afterward, at the Prestons, for we left the Presidents at an early hour, Major von Borke was trying to teach them his way of pronouncing his own name, and reciting numerous travesties of it in this country when Charles threw open the door, saying, "'A gentleman has called for Major Bandbox.' The Prussian Major acknowledged this to be the worst he had heard yet. Off to the Ives's theatricals. I walked with General Breckinridge. Mrs. Clay's Mrs. Malaprop was beyond our wildest hopes. And she was in such bitter earnest when she pinched Connie Carey's, Lydia Languish's, shoulder and called her an intricate little huzzy, that Lydia showed she felt it, and next day the shoulder was black and blue. It was not that the actress had a grudge against Connie, but that she was intense. Even the back of Mrs. Clay's head was eloquent as she walked away. But, said General Breckinridge, watch Hood. He has not seen the play before, and Bob Akers amazes him. When he caught my eye, General Hood nodded to me and said, I believe that fellow Akers is a coward. "'That's better than the play,' whispered Breckinridge. "'But it is all good, from Sir Anthony down to Fag.' Between the acts, Mrs. Clay sent us word to applaud. She wanted encouragement. The audience was too cold. General Breckinridge responded like a man. After that, she was fired by thunders of applause following his lead. Those mighty Kentuckians turned claqueurs were a host in themselves.' Constance Carey not only acted well, but looked perfectly beautiful. During the farce, Mrs. Clay came in with all her feathers, diamonds, and falals, and took her seat by me. Said General Breckinridge, What a splendid head of hair you have! And all my own, said she. Afterward, she said, they could not get false hair enough, so they put a pair of black satin boots on top of her head, and piled hair over them. We adjourned from Mrs. Ives's to Mrs. Old's, where we had the usual excellent Richmond supper. We did not get home until three. It was a clear moonlight night, almost as light as day. As we walked along, I said to General Breckinridge, You have spent a jolly evening. I do not know, he answered. I have asked myself more than once tonight, Are you the same man who stood gazing down on the faces of the dead on that awful battlefield? The soldiers lying there stare at you with their eyes wide open. Is this the same world, here and there? Last night the great Kentucky contingent came in a body. Hood brought Buck in his carriage. She said she did not like General Hood, and spoke with a wild excitement in those soft blue eyes of hers. Or are they gray or brown? She then gave her reasons in the lowest voice, but loud and distinct enough for him to hear. Why? He spoke so harshly to Sy, his body-servant, as we got out of the carriage. I saw how he hurt Sy's feelings, and I tried to soothe Sy's mortification. "'You see, Sy nearly caused me to fall by his awkwardness, and I stormed at him,' said the general, vastly amused. "'I hate a man who speaks roughly to those who dare not resent it,' said she. The general did own himself charmed with her sentiments, but seemed to think his wrongdoing all a good joke." He and Sy understand each other. February 9th. This party for Johnny was the very nicest I have ever had, and I mean it to be my last. I sent word to the Careys to bring their own men. They came alone, saying they did not care for men. 
"'That means a raid on ours,' growled Isabella. Mr. Lamar was devoted to Constance Carey. He is a free lance, so that created no heart-burning. Afterward, when the whole thing was over, and a success, the lights put out, etc., here trooped in the four girls, who stayed all night with me. In dressing gowns they stirred up a hot fire, relit the gas, and went in for their supper. Rechauffe was the word, oysters, hot coffee, etc. They kept it up till daylight. Of course, we slept very late. As they came in to breakfast, I remarked, The church bells have been going on like mad. I take it as a rebuke to our breaking the Sabbath. You know Sunday began at twelve o'clock last night. It sounds to me like fire bells, somebody said. Soon the infant dashed in, done up in soldier's clothes. The Yankees are upon us, said he. Don't you hear the alarm bells? They have been ringing day and night. Alex Haskell came. He and Johnny went off to report to Custis Lee and to be enrolled among his locals, who are always detailed for the defense of the city. But this time the attack on Richmond has proved a false alarm. A new trouble at the President's house. Their trusty man, Robert, broken out with smallpox. We went to the Webb Ball, and such a pleasant time we had. After a while, the PMG, Pet Major General, took his seat in the comfortable chair next to mine, and declared his determination to hold that position. Mr. Hunter and Mr. Benjamin essayed to dislodge him. Mrs. Stannard said, "'Take him in the flirtation room. There he will soon be captured and led away.' But I did not know where that room was situated. Besides, my bold Texan made a most unexpected sally. "'I will not go, and I will prevent her from going with any of you.' Supper was near at hand, and Mr. Mallory said, "'Ask him if the very alloyed is not at his house. I know it is.' I started as if I were shot, and I took Mr. Clay's arm and went in to supper, leaving the PMG to the girls. Venison and everything nice. February 12th. John Chestnut had a basket of champagne carried to my house, oysters, partridges, and other good things, for a supper after the reception. He is going back to the army tomorrow. James Chestnut arrived on Wednesday. He has been giving Buck his opinion of one of her performances last night. She was here, and the general's carriage drove up, bringing some of our girls. They told her he could not come up, and he begged she would go down there for a moment. She flew down and stood ten minutes in that snow, sigh holding the carriage door open. But, Colonel Chestnut, there was no harm. I was not there ten minutes. I could not get in the carriage, because I did not mean to stay one minute. He did not hold my hands, that is, not half the time. Oh, you saw. Well, he did kiss my hands. Where is the harm of that? All men worship Buck. How can they help it? She is so lovely. Lawrence has gone back ignominiously to South Carolina. At breakfast, already, in some inscrutable way, he had become intoxicated. He was told to move a chair, and he raised it high over his head, smashing Mrs. Grundy's chandelier. My husband said, Mary, do tell Lawrence to go home. I am too angry to speak to him. So Lawrence went without another word. He will soon be back, and when he comes he will say, Shoo, I knew Mars Jeems could not do without me. And indeed he cannot. Buck, reading my journal, opened her beautiful eyes in amazement and said, So little do people know themselves. See what you say of me. I replied, The girls heard him say to you, Oh, you are so childish and so sweet. Now, Buck, you know you are not childish. You have an abundance of strong common sense. Don't let men adore you so, if you can help it. You are so unhappy about men who care for you when they are killed. Isabella says that war leads to love-making. She says these soldiers do more courting here in a day than they would do at home without a war in ten years. In the pauses of conversation we hear, She is the noblest woman God ever made. Goodness, exclaims Isabella. Which one? The amount of courting we hear in these small rooms. Men have to go to the front, and they say their say desperately. I am beginning to know all about it. The girls tell me. And I overhear. I cannot help it. But this style is unique, is it not? 
Since I saw you last year, standing by the turnpike gate, you know, my battle cry has been, God, my country, and you. So many are lame. Major Venable says, It is not the devil on two sticks now. The farce is Cupid on crutches. General Breckinridge's voice broke in. They are my cousins, so I determined to kiss them good-bye. Good-bye nowadays is the very devil. It means forever, in all probability, you know, all the odds against us. So I advanced to the charge soberly, discreetly, and in the fear of the Lord. The girls stood in a row, four of the very prettiest I ever saw. Sam, with his eyes glued to the floor, cried, "'You were afraid. You backed out.' "'But I did nothing of the kind. I kissed every one of them, honestly, heartily.' "'February 13th. My husband is writing out some resolutions for the Congress. He is very busy, too, trying to get some poor fellows reprieved. He says they are good soldiers, but got into a scrape.' Buck came in. She had on her last winter's English hat, with the pheasant's wing. Just then Hood entered most unexpectedly. Said the blunt soldier to the girl, "'You look mighty pretty in that hat. You wore it at the turnpike gate, where I surrendered at first sight.' She nodded and smiled and flew down the steps after Mr. Chestnut, looking back to say that she meant to walk with him as far as the executive office." The general walked to the window and watched until the last flutter of her garment was gone. He said, The President was finding fault with some of his officers in command, and I said, Mr. President, why don't you come and lead us yourself? I would follow you to the death. Actually, if you stay here in Richmond much longer, you will grow to be a courtier. And you came a rough Texan. Mrs. Davis and General McQueen came. He tells me Musco Garnett is dead. Then the best and the cleverest Virginian I know is gone. He was the most scholarly man they had, and his character was higher than his requirements. Today a terrible onslaught was made upon the President for nepotism. Burton Harrison's and John Taylor Wood's letters denying the charge that the President's cotton was unburned, or that he left it to be bought by the Yankees, had enraged the opposition. How much these people in the President's family have to bear! I have never felt so indignant. February 16th. Saw in Mrs. Howell's room the little negro Mrs. Davis rescued yesterday from his brutal negro guardian. The child is an orphan. He was dressed up in little Joe's clothes and happy as a lord. He was very anxious to show me his wounds and bruises, but I fled. There are some things in life too sickening, and cruelty is one of them. Somebody said, People who knew General Hood before the war said there was nothing in him. As for losing his property by the war, some say he never had any, and that West Point is a pauper's school, after all. He has only military glory, and that he has gained since the war began. Now, said Burton Harrison, only military glory. I like that. The glory and the fame he has gained during the war, that is Hood. What was Napoleon before Toulon? Hood has the impassive dignity of an Indian chief. He has always a little court around him of devoted friends. Wigfall himself has said he could not get within Hood's lines. February 17th. Found everything in Main Street 20% dearer. They say it is due to the new currency bill. I asked my husband, Is General Johnston ordered to reinforce Polk? They say he did not understand the order. After five days' delay, he replied, They say Sherman is marching to Mobile. When they once get inside of our armies, what is to molest them unless it be women with broomsticks? Footnote. General Polk, commanding about 24,000 men scattered throughout Mississippi and Alabama, found it impossible to check the advance of Sherman at the head of some 40,000, and moved from Meridian south to protect Mobile. February 16, 1864, Sherman took possession of Meridian. In footnote. General Johnston writes that the governor of Georgia refuses him provisions in the use of his roads. The governor of Georgia writes, The roads are open to him and in capital condition. I have furnished him abundantly with provisions from time to time, as he desired them. 
I suppose both of these letters are placed away side by side in our archives. February 20th. Mrs. Preston was offended by the story of Buck's performance at the Ives's. General Breckinridge told her it was the most beautifully unconscious act he ever saw. The general was leaning against the wall, Buck standing guard by him on her two feet. The crowd surged that way, and she held out her arm to protect him from the rush. After they had all passed, she handed him his crutches, and they, too, moved slowly away. Mrs. Davis said, any woman in Richmond would have done the same joyfully, but few could do it so gracefully. Buck is made so conspicuous by her beauty, whatever she does cannot fail to attract attention. Johnny stayed at home only one day, then went to his plantation, got several thousand Confederate dollars, and in the afternoon drove out with Mrs. K. At the B store he spent a thousand of his money, bought us gloves and linen, well, one can do without gloves, but linen is next to life itself. Yesterday the President walked home from church with me. He said he was so glad to see my husband at church, had never seen him there before, remarked on how well he looked, etc. I replied that he looked so well, because you have never before seen him in the part of the right man in the right place. My husband has no fancy for being planted in pews, but he is utterly Christian in his creed. February 23rd. At the President's, where General Lee breakfasted, a man named Phelan told General Lee all he ought to do, planned a campaign for him. General Lee smiled blandly the while, though he did permit himself a mild sneer at the wise civilians in Congress who refrained from trying the battlefield in person, but from afar dictated the movements of armies. My husband said that, to his amazement, General Lee came into his room at the executive office to pay his respects and have a talk. "'Dear me! Goodness gracious!' said I. "'That was a compliment from the head of the army, the very first man in the world, we Confederates think.'" February 24th. Friends came to make taffy and stayed the live-long day. They played cards. One man, a soldier, had only two teeth left in front, and they lapped across each other. On account of the condition of his mouth, he had maintained a dignified sobriety of aspect, though he told some funny stories. Finally, a story was too much for him, and he grinned from ear to ear. Maggie gazed, and then called out, as the negro fiddlers call out dancing figures, Forward to and cross over. Fancy our faces. The hero of the two teeth, relapsing into a decorous arrangement of mouth, said, Cavalry are the eyes of an army. They bring the news. The artillery are the boys to make a noise. But the infantry do the fighting, and a general or so gets all the glory. February 26th. We went to see Mrs. Breckinridge, who is here with her husband. Then we paid our respects to Mrs. Lee. Her room was like an industrial school. Everybody so busy. Her daughters were all there plying their needles with several other ladies. Mrs. Lee showed us a beautiful sword, recently sent to the general by some Marylanders, now in Paris. On the blade was engraved, Et toi et du tédra. When we came out, someone said, Did you see how the Lees spend their time? What a rebuke to the taffy parties. Another maimed hero is engaged to be married. Sally Hampton has accepted John Haskell. There is a story that he reported for duty after his arm was shot off. Suppose, in the fury of the battle, he did not feel the pain. General Breckinridge once asked, What's the name of the fellow who has gone to Europe for Hood's leg? Dr. Darby. Suppose it is shipwrecked. No matter, half a dozen are ordered. Mrs. Preston raised her hands. No wonder the general says they talk of him as if he were a centipede. His leg is in everybody's mouth. March 3rd. Hetty the handsome and Constance the witty came, the former too prudish to read Lost and Saved by Mrs. Norton after she had heard the plot. Connie was making a bonnet for me. Just as she was leaving the house, her friendly labors over, my husband entered and quickly ordered his horse. It is so near dinner, I began. But I am going with the president. I am on duty. He goes to inspect the fortifications. The enemy, once more, are within a few miles of Richmond. 
Then we prepared a luncheon for him. Constance Carey remained with me. After she left, I sat down to Romola, and I was absorbed in it. How hardened we grow to war and war's alarms! The enemy's cannon, or our own, are thundering in my ears, and I was dreadfully afraid some infatuated and frightened friend would come in to cheer, to comfort, and interrupt me. Am I the same poor soul who fell on her knees and prayed, and wept, and fainted, as the first gun boomed from Fort Sumter? Once more we have repulsed the enemy. But it is humiliating, indeed, that he can come and threaten us at our very gates whenever he so pleases. If a forlorn negro had not led them astray, and they hanged him for it, on Tuesday night, unmolested, they would have walked into Richmond. Surely there is horrid neglect or mismanagement somewhere. March 4th. The enemy has been reinforced and is on us again. Met Wade Hampton, who told me my husband was to join him with some volunteer troops, so I hurried home. Such a cavalcade rode up to luncheon. Captain Smith Lee and Preston Hampton, the handsomest, the oldest, and the youngest of the party. This was at the Prestons. Smith Lee walked home with me, alarm bells ringing, horsemen galloping, wagons rattling. Dr. H. stopped us to say Beast Butler was on us with 16,000 men. How scared the doctor looked. And after all, it was only a notice to the militia to turn out and drill. March 5th. Tom Ferguson walked home with me. He told me of Colonel Dahlgren's death and the horrid memoranda found in his pocket. He came with secret orders to destroy this devoted city, hang the president and his cabinet, and burn the town. Fitzhugh Lee was proud that the Ninth Virginia captured him. Footnote. Colonel Ulrich Dahlgren was a son of the noted Admiral John H. Dahlgren, who, in July 1863, had been placed in command of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron and conducted the naval operations against Charleston between July 10 and September 7, 1863. Colonel Dahlgren distinguished himself at Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, and Gettysburg. The raid in which he lost his life on March 4, 1864, was planned by himself and General Kilpatrick. In footnote found Mrs. Sims covering her lettuces and radishes as calmly as if Yankee raiders were a myth. While Beast Butler holds Fortress Monroe, he will make things lively for us. On the alert must we be now. End of chapter 16, part 4read by Laurie Ann Walden. A Diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter 16. Richmond, Virginia. Part 5. March 7th. Shopping, and paid $30 for a pair of gloves, $50 for a pair of slippers, $24 for six spools of thread, $32 for five miserable, shabby little pocket handkerchiefs. When I came home, found Mrs. Webb. At her hospital there was a man who had been taken prisoner by Dahlgren's party. He saw the negro hanged who had misled them, unintentionally, in all probability. He saw Dahlgren give a part of his bridle to hang him. Details are melancholy, as Emerson says. This Dahlgren had also lost a leg. Constance Carey, in words too fine for the occasion, described the homely scene at my house, how I prepared sandwiches for my husband, and broke, with trembling hand, the last bottle of anything to drink in the house a bottle I destined to go with the sandwiches. She called it a Hector and Andromache performance. March 8th. Mrs. Preston's story. As we walked home, she told me she had just been to see a lady she had known more than twenty years before. She had met her in this wise. One of the chambermaids of the St. Charles Hotel, New Orleans, told Mrs. Preston's nurse, it was when Mary Preston was a baby, that up among the servants in the garret there was a sick lady and her children. The maid was sure she was a lady, and thought she was hiding from somebody. Mrs. Preston went up, knew the lady, had her brought down into comfortable rooms, and nursed her until she recovered from her delirium and fever. She had run away, indeed, and was hiding herself and her children from a worthless husband. Now she has one son in a Yankee prison, one mortally wounded, and the last of them dying there under her eyes of consumption. This last had married here in Richmond, 
not wisely, and too soon, for he was a mere boy. His pay as a private was eleven dollars a month, and his wife's family charged him three hundred dollars a month for her board. So he had to work double tides, do odd jobs by night and by day, and it killed him by exposure to cold in this bitter climate to which his constitution was unadapted. They had been in Vicksburg during the siege, and during the bombardment sought refuge in a cave. The roar of the cannon ceasing, they came out gladly for a breath of fresh air. At the moment when they emerged, a bomb burst there, among them, so to speak, struck the sun already wounded, and smashed off the arm of a beautiful little grandchild not three years old. There was this poor little girl with her touchingly lovely face and her arm gone. This mutilated little martyr, Mrs. Preston said, was really to her the crowning touch of the woman's affliction. Mrs. Preston put up her hand. Her baby face haunts me. March 11th. Letters from home, including one from my husband's father, now over ninety, written with his own hand, and certainly his own mind still. I quote, Bad times, worse coming. Starvation stares me in the face. Neither John's nor James's overseer will sell me any corn. Now what has the government to do with the fact that on all his plantations he made corn enough to last for the whole year, and by the end of January his negroes had stolen it all? Poor old man, he has fallen on evil days, after a long life of ease and prosperity. Today I read the Blythedale romance. Blythedale leaves such an unpleasant impression. I like pleasant, kindly stories, now that we are so harrowed by real life. Tragedy is for our hours of ease. March 12th. An active campaign has begun everywhere. Kilpatrick still threatens us. Bragg has organized his 1,500 of cavalry to protect Richmond. Why can't my husband be made colonel of that? It is a new regiment. No, he must be made a general. Now, says Mary Preston, Dr. Darby is at the mercy of both Yankees and the Rolling Sea, and I am anxious enough. But instead of taking my bed and worrying Mama, I am taking stock of our worldly goods and trying to arrange the wedding paraphernalia for two girls. There is love-making and love-making in this world. What a time the sweethearts of that wretch young Shakespeare must have had! What experiences of life's delights must have been his before he evolved the Romeo and Juliet business from his own internal consciousness! Also that delicious Beatrice and Rosalind! The poor creature that he left his second-best bedstead to came in second-best all the time, no doubt, and she hardly deserved more. Fancy people wondering that Shakespeare and his kind leave no progeny like themselves. Shakespeare's children would have been half his only, the other half only the second-best bedsteads. What would you expect of that commingling of materials? Goethe used his lady-loves as school-books are used. He studied them from cover to cover, got all that could be got of self-culture and knowledge of human nature from the study of them, and then threw them aside as if of no further account in his life. Byron never could forget Lord Byron, poet and peer, and mauvais sujet, and he must have been a trying lover, like talking to a man looking in the glass at himself. Lady Byron was just as much taken up with herself, so they struck each other and bounded apart. Since I wrote this, Mrs. Stowe has taken Byron in hand. But I know a story which might have annoyed my lord more than her and Lady Byron's imagination of wickedness, for he posed a fiend, but was tender and kind. A clerk in a country store asked my sister to lend him a book. He wanted something to read. The days were so long. What style of book would you prefer? she said. Poetry. Any particular poet? Brown. I hear him much spoken of. Browning? No, Brown. Short. That is what they call him. Byron, you mean. No, I mean the poet, Brown. Oh, you wish you had lived in the time of the Shakespeare creature. He knew all the forms and phases of true love. Straight to one's heart he goes, in tragedy or comedy. He never misses fire. He has been there, in slang phrase. No doubt the man's bare presence gave pleasure to the female world. He saw women at their best, and he effaced himself. He told no tales of his own life. Compare with him old, sad, solemn, sublime, sneering, snarling, fault-finding Milton, 
a man whose family doubtless found les absences délicieuses. That phrase describes a type of man at a touch. It took a Frenchwoman to do it. But there is an Italian picture of Milton taken in his youth, and he was as beautiful as an angel. No doubt, but love flies before everlasting posing and preaching, the deadly requirement of a man always to be looked up to, a domestic tyrant, grim, formal, and awfully learned. Milton was only a mere man, for he could not do without women. When he tired out the first poor thing, who did not fall down, worship and obey him, and see God in him, and she ran away, he immediately arranged his creed so that he could take another wife, for a wife he must have, a la Mohammedan creed. The deer-stealer never once thought of justifying theft, simply because he loved venison and could not come by it lawfully. Shakespeare was a better man, or, may I say, a purer soul, than self-upholding, Calvinistic, Puritanic, king-killing Milton. There is no muddling of right and wrong in Shakespeare, and no pharisaical stuff of any sort. Then George Dees joined us, fresh from Mobile, where he left peace and plenty. He went to sixteen weddings and twenty-seven tea-parties. For breakfast he had everything nice. Lily told of what she had seen the day before at the Spotswood. She was in the small parlor waiting for someone, and in the large drawing-room sat Hood, solitary, sad, with crutches by his chair. He could not see them. Mrs. Buckner came in, and her little girl, who, when she spied Hood, bounded into the next room and sprang into his lap. Hood smoothed her little dress down and held her close to him. She clung around his neck for a while, and then, seizing him by the beard, kissed him to an illimitable extent. Prettiest picture I ever saw, said Lily, the soldier and the child. John R. Thompson sent me a New York Herald only three days old. It is down on Kilpatrick for his miserable failure before Richmond. Also it acknowledges a defeat before Charleston, and a victory for us in Florida. General Grant is charmed with Sherman's successful movements, says he has destroyed millions upon millions of our property in Mississippi. I hope that may not be true, and that Sherman may fail, as Kilpatrick did. Now, if we still had Stonewall, or Albert Sidney Johnston, where Joe Johnston and Polk are, I would not give a fig for Sherman's chances. The Yankees say that at last they have scared up a man who succeeds, and they expect him to remedy all that has gone wrong. So they have made their brutal Suaro, Grant, Lieutenant General. Dr. Blank at the Prestons proposed to show me a man who was not an FFV. Until we came here, we had never heard of our social position. We do not know how to be rude to people who call. To talk of social position seems vulgar. Down our way, that sort of thing was settled one way or another beyond a peradventure, like the earth and the sky. We never gave it a thought. We talked to whom we pleased, and if they were not comme il faut, we were ever so much more polite to the poor things. No reflection on Virginia. Everybody comes to Richmond. Somebody counted fourteen generals in church today, and suggested that less piety and more drilling of commands would suit the times better. There were Lee, Longstreet, Morgan, Hoke, Klingman, Whiting, Pegram, Elsey, Gordon, and Bragg. Now, since Dahlgren failed to carry out his orders, the Yankees disowned them, disavowing all. He was not sent here to murder us all, to hang the president and burn the town. There is the notebook, however, at the executive office, with orders to hang and burn. March 15th. Old Mrs. Chestnut is dead. A saint is gone, and James Chestnut is broken-hearted. He adored his mother. I gave $375 for my mourning, which consists of a black alpaca dress and a crepe veil. With bonnet, gloves, and all, it came to $500. Before the blockade, such things as I have would not have been thought fit for a chambermaid. Everybody is in trouble. Mrs. Davis says paper money has depreciated so much in value that they cannot live within their income, so they are going to dispense with their carriage and horses. March 18th. Went out to sell some of my colored dresses. What a scene it was! Such piles of rubbish! And mixed up with it such splendid Parisian silks and satins. A mulatto woman kept the shop under a roof in an out-of-the-way old house. The seed of aunt rich white women sell to, and the negroes buy of, this woman. After some whispering among us, Buck said, 
Sally is going to marry a man who has lost an arm, and she is proud of it. The cause glorifies such wounds. Annie said meekly, I fear it will be my fate to marry one who has lost his head. Tootie has her eyes on one who has lost an eye. What a glorious assortment of noble martyrs and heroes. The bitterness of this kind of talk is appalling. General Lee had tears in his eyes when he spoke of his daughter-in-law just dead, that lovely little Charlotte Wickham, Mrs. Rooney Lee. Rooney Lee says Beast Butler was very kind to him while he was a prisoner. The Beast has sent him back his war horse. The Lees are men enough to speak the truth of friend or enemy, fearing not the consequences. March 19th. A new experience. Molly and Lawrence have both gone home, and I am to be left for the first time in my life wholly at the mercy of hired servants. Mr. Chestnut being in such deep mourning for his mother, we see no company. I have a maid of all work. Tootie came with an account of yesterday's trip to Petersburg. Constance Carey raved of the golden ripples in Tootie's hair. Tootie vanished in a halo of glory, and Constance Carey gave me an account of a wedding, as it was given to her by Major von Borke. The bridesmaids were dressed in black, the bride in Confederate gray, homespun. She had worn the dress all winter, but it had been washed and turned for the wedding. The female critics pronounced it flabby-dabby. They also said her collar was only net, and she wore a cameo breastpin. Her bonnet was self-made. March 24th. Yesterday we went to the Capitol grounds to see our returned prisoners. We walked slowly up and down until Jeff Davis was called upon to speak. There I stood, almost touching the bayonets when he left me. I looked straight into the prisoners' faces, poor fellows. They cheered with all their might, and I wept for sympathy and enthusiasm. I was very deeply moved. These men were so forlorn, so dried up and shrunken, with such a strange look in some of their eyes. Others so restless and wild-looking. Others again placidly vacant, as if they had been dead to the world for years. A poor woman was too much for me. She was searching for her son. He had been expected back. She said he was taken prisoner at Gettysburg. She kept going in and out among them with a basket of provisions she had brought for him to eat. It was too pitiful. She was utterly unconscious of the crowd. The anxious dread, expectation, hurry, and hope which led her own showed in her face. A sister of Mrs. Lincoln is here. She brings the freshest scandals from Yankee land. She says she rode with Lovejoy. A friend of hers commands a black regiment. Two southern horrors, a black regiment and Lovejoy. March 31st. Met Preston Hampton. Constance Carey was with me. She showed her regard for him by taking his overcoat and leaving him in a drenching rain. What boyish nonsense he talked, said he was in love with Miss Dabney now, that his love was so hot within him that he was waterproof. The rain sizzed and smoked off. It did not so much as dampen his ardor or his clothes. April 1st. Mrs. Davis is utterly depressed. She said the fall of Richmond must come. She would send her children to me and Mrs. Preston. We begged her to come to us also. My husband is as depressed as I ever knew him to be. He has felt the death of that angel mother of his keenly, and now he takes his country's woes to heart. April 11th. Drove with Mrs. Davis and all her infant family. Wonderfully clever and precocious children with unbroken wills. At one time there was a sudden uprising of the nursery contingent. They laughed, fought, and screamed. Bedlam broke loose. Mrs. Davis scolded, laughed, and cried. She asked me if my husband would speak to the President about the plan in South Carolina, which everybody said suited him. No, Mrs. Davis, said I. That is what I told Mr. Davis, said she. Colonel Chestnut rides so high a horse. Now Brown is so much more practical. He goes forth to be general of conscripts in Georgia. His wife will stay at the Cobbses. Mrs. Old gave me a luncheon on Saturday. I felt that this was my last sad farewell to Richmond and the people there I love so well. Mrs. Davis sent her carriage for me, and we went to the Olds together. Such good things were served, oranges, guava jelly, etc. The examiner says Mr. Old, when he goes to Fortress Monroe, replenishes his larder. Why not? 
The examiner has taken another fling at the president, as haughty and austere with his friends, affable, kind, subservient to his enemies. I wonder if the Yankees would endorse that certificate. Both sides abuse him. He cannot please anybody, it seems. No doubt he is right. My husband is now Brigadier General, and is sent to South Carolina to organize and take command of the reserve troops. C. C. Clay and L. Q. C. Lamar are both spoken of to fill the vacancy made among Mr. Davis's aides by this promotion. Today Captain Smith Lee spent the morning here and gave a review of past Washington gossip. I am having such a busy, happy life, with so many friends, and my friends are so clever, so charming. But the change to that weary, dreary Camden. Mary Preston said, I do think Mrs. Chestnut deserves to be canonized. She agrees to go back to Camden. The Prestons gave me a farewell dinner, my twenty-fourth wedding day, and the very pleasantest day I have spent in Richmond. Maria Lewis was sitting with us on Mrs. Eugee's steps, and Smith Lee was lauding Virginia people as usual. As Lee would say, there hove in sight Frank Parker, riding one of the finest of General Bragg's horses. By his side, Buck, on Fairfax, the most beautiful horse in Richmond, his brown coat looking like satin, his proud neck arched, moving slowly, gracefully, calmly, no fidgets, aristocratic in his bearing to the tips of his bridle reins. There sat Buck, tall and fair, managing her horse with infinite ease, her English riding habit showing plainly the exquisite proportions of her figure. Supremely lovely, said Smith Lee. Look at them both, said I proudly. Can you match those two in Virginia? Three cheers for South Carolina, was the answer of Lee, the gallant Virginia sailor. End of chapter 16《セブンティーン・オブ・ア・ダイアリー・フォン・ディクシー》。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden.《アダイアリー・フォン・ディクシー》by Mary Chestnut. Chapter Seventeen. Camden, South Carolina, May eighth, eighteen sixty-four to June one, eighteen sixty-four. Camden, South Carolina, May eighth, eighteen sixty-four. My friends crowded around me so in those last days in Richmond. I forgot the affairs of this nation utterly, though I did show faith in my Confederate country by buying poor Bones's. My English maids, Confederate bonds. I gave her gold thimbles, bracelets, whatever was gold and would sell in New York or London. I gave. My friends in Richmond grieved that I had to leave them, not half so much, however, as I did that I must come away. Those last weeks were so pleasant. No battle, no murder, no sudden death. All went merry as a marriage bell. Clever, cordial, kind, brave friends rallied around me. Maggie Howell and I went down the river to see an exchange of prisoners. Our party were the Lees, Mallorys, Mrs. Buck Allen, Mrs. Old. We picked up Judge Old and Buck Allen at Curl's Neck. I had seen no genuine Yankees before. Prisoners, well or wounded, had been German, Scotch, or Irish. Among our men coming ashore was an officer who had charge of some letters for a friend of mine whose fiance had died. I gave him her address. One other man showed me some wonderfully ingenious things he had made while a prisoner. One said they gave him rations for a week. He always devoured them in three days. He could not help it. And then he had to bear the inevitable agony of those four remaining days. Many were wounded. Some were maimed for life. They were very cheerful. We had supper, or some nondescript meal, with ice cream on board. The band played Home Sweet Home. One man tapped another on the shoulder. Well, how do you feel, old fellow? Never was so near crying in my life, for very comfort. Governor Cummings, a Georgian, late governor of Utah, was among the returned prisoners. He had been in prison two years. His wife was with him. He was a striking-looking person, huge in size, and with snow-white hair, fat as a prize ox, with no sign of Yankee barbarity or starvation about him. That evening, as we walked up to Mrs. Davis's carriage, which was waiting for us at the landing, Dr. Garnett with Maggie Howell, Major Hall with me, suddenly I heard her scream, and someone stepped back in the dark and said in a whisper, "'Little Joe, he has killed himself!' I felt reeling, faint, bewildered. 
a chattering woman clutched my arm. "'Mrs. Davis's son? Impossible. Whom did you say? Was he an interesting child? How old was he?' The shock was terrible, and unnerved as I was, I cried, "'For God's sake, take her away!' Then Maggie and I drove two long miles in silence, except for Maggie's hysterical sobs. She was wild with terror. The news was broken to her in that abrupt way at the carriage door, so that at first she thought it had all happened there, and that poor little Joe was in the carriage. Mr. Burton Harrison met us at the door of the executive mansion. Mrs. Sims and Mrs. Barksdale were there, too. Every window and door of the house seemed wide open, and the wind was blowing the curtains. It was lighted, even in the third story. As I sat in the drawing-room, I could hear the tramp of Mr. Davis's step as he walked up and down the room above. Not another sound. The whole house as silent as death. It was then twelve o'clock, so I went home and waked General Chestnut, who had gone to bed. We went immediately back to the President's, found Mrs. Sims still there, but saw no one but her. We thought some friends of the family ought to be in the house. Mrs. Sims said when she got there that little Jeff was kneeling down by his brother, and he called out to her in great distress, "'Mrs. Sims, I have said all the prayers I know how, but God will not wake Joe.' Poor little Joe, the good child of the family, was so gentle and affectionate. He used to run in to say his prayers at his father's knee. Now he was laid out somewhere above us, crushed and killed. Mrs. Sims, describing the accident, said he fell from the high north piazza upon a brick pavement. Before I left the house I saw him lying there, white and beautiful as an angel, covered with flowers. Catherine, his nurse, flat on the floor by his side, was weeping and wailing as only an Irish woman can. Immense crowds came to the funeral, everybody sympathetic, but some shoving and pushing rudely. There were thousands of children, and each child had a green bough or a bunch of flowers to throw on little Joe's grave, which was already a mass of white flowers, crosses, and evergreens. The morning I came away from Mrs. Davis's, early as it was, I met a little child with a handful of snowdrops. "'Put these on little Joe,' she said. "'I knew him so well.' and then she turned and fled without another word. I did not know who she was, then or now. As I walked home I met Mr. Reagan, then Wade Hampton, but I could see nothing but little Joe and his broken-hearted mother, and Mr. Davis's step still sounded in my ears as he walked the floor the live-long night. General Lee was to have a grand review the very day we left Richmond. Great numbers of people were to go up by rail to see it. Miss Turner McFarland writes, They did go, but they came back faster than they went. They found the army drawn up in battle array. Many of the brave and gay spirits that we saw so lately have taken flight, the only flight they know, and their bodies are left dead upon the battlefield. Poor old Edward Johnston is wounded again, and a prisoner. Jones's brigade broke first. He was wounded the day before. At Wilmington we met General Whiting. He sent us to the station in his carriage, and bestowed upon us a bottle of brandy which had run the blockade. They say Beauregard has taken his sword from Whiting. Never. I will not believe it. At the capture of Fort Sumter they said Whiting was the brains, Beauregard only the hand. Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou fallen, that they should even say such a thing! My husband and Mr. Covey got out at Florence to procure for Mrs. Miles a cup of coffee. They were slow about it, and they got left. I did not mind this so very much, for I remembered that we were to remain all day at Kingsville, and that my husband could overtake me there by the next train. My maid belonged to the Prestons. She was only traveling home with me, and would go straight on to Columbia. So without fear I stepped off at Kingsville. My old Confederate silk, like most Confederate dresses, had seen better days and I noticed that, like Oliver Wendell Holmes's famous one-hoss shay, it had gone to pieces suddenly, and all over. It was literally in strips. I became painfully aware of my forlorn aspect when I asked the telegraph man the way to the hotel, and he was by no means respectful to me. I was, indeed, alone, an old and not too respectable-looking woman. It was my first appearance in the character, and I laughed aloud. 
A very haughty and highly painted dame greeted me at the hotel. "'No room,' said she. "'Who are you?' I gave my name. "'Try something else,' said she. "'Mrs. Chestnut don't travel round by herself with no servants and no nothing.' I looked down. There I was, dirty, tired, tattered, and torn. "'Where do you come from?' said she. "'My home is in Camden.' "'Come now, I know everybody in Camden.' I sat down meekly on a bench in the piazza that was free to all wayfarers. "'Which Mrs. Chestnut?' said she, sharply. "'I know both.' "'I am now the only one. "'And now what is the matter with you? "'Do you take me for a spy? "'I know you perfectly well. "'I went to school with you at Miss Henrietta de Leon's, "'and my name was Mary Miller.' THE LORD SAKES ALIVE, AND TO THINK YOU ARE HER. NOW I SEE. DEAR, DEAR ME. HEAVEN SAKES, WOMAN, BUT YOU ARE BROKE. AND TORE, I ADDED, HOLDING UP MY DRESS. BUT I HAD HAD NO IDEA IT WAS SO DIFFICULT TO EFFECT AN ENTRY INTO A RAILROAD WAYSIDE HOTEL. I PICKED UP A LONG STRIP OF MY OLD BLACK DRESS, TORN OFF BY A MAN'S SPUR AS I PASSED HIM GETTING OFF THE TRAIN. It is sad enough at Mulberry without old Mrs. Chestnut, who was the good genius of the place. It is so lovely here in spring. The giants of the forest, the primeval oaks, water oaks, live oaks, willow oaks, such as I have not seen since I left here, with opopinax, violets, roses, and yellow jessamine, the air is laden with perfume. Araby the blessed was never sweeter. Inside are creature comforts of all kinds, green peas, strawberries, asparagus, spring lamb, spring chicken, fresh eggs, rich yellow butter, clean white linen for one's beds, dazzling white damask for one's table. It is such a contrast to Richmond, where I wish I were. Fighting is going on. Hampton is frantic, for his laggard new regiments fall in slowly. No fault of the soldiers, they are as disgusted as he is. Bragg, Bragg, the head of the war office, cannot organize in time. John Boykin has died in a Yankee prison. He had on a heavy flannel shirt when lying in an open platform car on the way to a cold prison on the lakes. A federal soldier wanted John's shirt. Prisoners have no rights, so John had to strip off and hand his shirt to him. That caused his death. In two days he was dead of pneumonia, maybe frozen to death. One man said, They are taking us there to freeze. But then their men will find our hot sun in August and July as deadly as our men find their cold Decembers. Their snow and ice finish our prisoners at a rapid rate, they say. Napoleon soldiers found out all that in the Russian campaign. Have brought my houseless, homeless friends, refugees here, to luxuriate in Mulberry's plenty. I can but remember the lavish kindness of the Virginia people when I was there and in a similar condition. The Virginia people do the rarest acts of hospitality, and never seem to know it is not in the ordinary course of events. The President's man, Stephen, bringing his master's Arabian to Mulberry for safekeeping, said, "'Why, missus, your niggers down here are well off. I call this Mulberry place heaven, with plenty to eat, little to do, warm house to sleep in, a good church.' John L. Miller, my cousin, has been killed at the head of his regiment. The blows now fall so fast on our heads they are bewildering. The Secretary of War authorizes General Chestnut to reorganize the men who have been hitherto detailed for special duty, and also those who have been exempt. He says General Chestnut originated the plan and organized the corps of clerks which saved Richmond in the Dahlgren raid. May 27th. In all this beautiful sunshine, in the stillness and shade of these long hours on this piazza, all comes back to me about little Joe. It haunts me, that scene in Richmond where all seemed confusion, madness, a bad dream. Here I see that funeral procession as it wound among those tall white monuments, up that hillside, the James River tumbling about below over rocks and around islands. The dominant figure, that poor old gray-haired man, standing bareheaded, straight as an arrow, clear against the sky by the open grave of his son. She, the bereft mother, stood back, in her heavy black wrappings, and her tall figure drooped. The flowers, the children, the procession as it moved, 
comes and goes. But those two dark, sorrow-stricken figures stand. They are before me now. That night, with no sound but the heavy tramp of his feet overhead, the curtains flapping in the wind, the gas flaring, I was numb, stupid, half-dead with grief and terror. Then came Catherine's Irish howl. Cheap was that. Where was she when it all happened? Her place was to have been with the child. Who saw him fall? Whom will they kill next of that devoted household? Read today the list of killed and wounded. Footnote. During the month of May, 1864, important battles had been fought in Virginia, including that of the Wilderness on May 6th through 7th, and the series later in that month around Spotsylvania Courthouse. End footnote. One long column was not enough for South Carolina's dead. I see Mr. Federal Secretary Stanton says he can reinforce Suwaro Grant at his leisure whenever he calls for more. He has just sent him 25,000 veterans. Old Lincoln says, in his quaint backwoods way, Keep a peggin. Now we can only peg out. What have we left of men, etc., to meet these reinforcements as often as reinforcements are called for? Our fighting men have all gone to the front. Only old men and little boys are at home now. It is impossible to sleep here, because it is so solemn and still. The moonlight shines in my window, sad and white and the soft south wind literally comes over a bank of violets, lilacs, roses, with orange blossoms and magnolia flowers. Mrs. Chestnut was only a year younger than her husband. He is ninety-two or three. She was deaf, but he retains his senses wonderfully for his great age. I have always been an early riser. Formerly, I often saw him sauntering slowly down the broad passage from his room to hers, in a flowing flannel dressing gown when it was winter. In the spring he was apt to be in shirt-sleeves, with suspenders hanging down his back. He had always a large hairbrush in his hand. He would take his stand on the rug before the fire in her room, brushing scant locks which were fleecy white. Her maid would be doing hers, which were dead-leaf brown, not a white hair in her head. He had the voice of a stentor, and there he stood roaring his morning compliments. The people who occupied the room above said he fairly shook the window glasses. This pleasant morning greeting ceremony was never omitted. Her voice was soft and low, the oft quoted. Philadelphia seems to have lost the art of sending forth such voices now. Mrs. Benny, old Mrs. Chestnut's sister, came among us with the same softly modulated, womanly, musical voice. Her clever and beautiful daughters were criard. Judge Hand said, Philadelphia women scream like macaws. This morning as I passed Mrs. Chestnut's room, the door stood wide open, and I heard a pitiful sound. The old man was kneeling by her empty bedside, sobbing bitterly. I fled down the middle walk, anywhere out of reach of what was never meant for me to hear. June 1st. We have been to Bloomsbury again, and hear that William Kirkland has been wounded. A scene occurred then, Mary weeping bitterly, and Aunt B. frantic as to Tanny's danger. I proposed to make arrangements for Mary to go on at once. The judge took me aside, frowning angrily. You are unwise to talk in that way. She can neither take her infant nor leave it. The cars are closed by order of the government to all but soldiers. I told him of the woman who, when the conductor said she could not go, cried at the top of her voice, Soldiers, I want to go to Richmond to nurse my wounded husband. In a moment, twenty men made themselves her bodyguard, and she went on unmolested. The judge said I talked nonsense. I said I would go on in my carriage if need be. Besides, there would be no difficulty in getting Mary a permit. He answered hotly that in no case would he let her go, and that I had better not go back into the house. We were on the piazza, and my carriage at the door. I took it and crossed over to see Mary Boykin. She was weeping, too, so washed away with tears one would hardly know her. So many killed. My son and my husband. I do not hear a word from them. Gave today for two pounds of tea, forty pounds of coffee, and sixty pounds of sugar. Eight hundred dollars. Beauregard is a gentleman, and was a genius as long as Whiting did his engineering for him. 
Our Creole general is not quite so clever as he thinks himself. Mary Ford writes for school books for her boys. She is in great distress on the subject. When Longstreet's corps passed through Greenville, there was great enthusiasm. Handkerchiefs were waved, bouquets and flowers were thrown to troops. Her boys, having nothing else to throw, threw their school books. End of chapter 17「One of a Diary from Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. A Diary from Dixie by Mary Chestnut. Chapter 18. Columbia, South Carolina. July 6, 1864 to January 17, 1865. Part 1. Columbia, South Carolina. July 6, 1864. At the Prestons, Mary was laughing at Mrs. Lyon's complaint, the person from whom we rented rooms in Richmond. She spoke of Molly and Lawrence's deceitfulness. They went about the house quiet as mice while we were at home, or Lawrence sat at the door and sprang to his feet whenever we passed. But when we were out, they sang, laughed, shouted, and danced. If any of the Lyons family passed him, Lawrence kept his seat, with his hat on, too. Mrs. Chestnut had said, Oh, so meekly to the whole tirade, and added, I will see about it. Colonel Urquhart and Edmund Rhett dined here, charming men both, no brag, no detraction. Talk is never pleasant where there is either. Our noble Georgian dined here. He says Hampton was the hero of the Yankee rout at Stony Creek. Footnote. The Battle of Stony Creek in Virginia was fought on June 28 through 29, 1864. End footnote. He claims that citizens, militia, and lame soldiers kept the bridge at Staunton and gallantly repulsed Wilson's raiders. At Mrs. S.'s last night, she came up, saying, In New Orleans, four people never met together without dancing. Edmund Rhett turned to me. You shall be pressed into service. No, I belong to the Reserve Corps, too old to volunteer or to be drafted as a conscript. But I had to go. My partner in the dance showed his English descent. He took his pleasure sadly. Oh, Mr. Rhett, at his pleasure, can be a most agreeable companion, said someone. I never happened to meet him, said I, when he pleased to be otherwise. With a hot, draggled, old alpaca dress and these clod-hopping shoes, to tumble slowly and gracefully through the mazes of a July dance was too much for me. What depresses you so? he anxiously inquired. Our carnival of death. What a blunder to bring us all together here, a reunion of consumptives to dance and sing until one can almost hear the death rattle. July 25th. Now we are in a cottage rented from Dr. Chisholm. Hood is a full general. Johnston has been removed and superseded. Footnote. General Johnston, in 1863, had been appointed to command the Army of the Tennessee, with headquarters at Dalton, Georgia. He was to oppose the advance of Sherman's army toward Atlanta. In May 1864, he fought unsuccessful battles at Resaca and elsewhere, and in July was compelled to retreat across the Chattahoochee River. Fault was found with him because of his continual retreating. There were tremendous odds against him. On July 17th, he was superseded by Hood. End footnote. Early is threatening Washington City. Sims, of whom we have been so proud, risked the Alabama in a sort of duel of ships. He has lowered the flag of the famous Alabama to the Kearsarge. Forgive who may, I cannot. Footnote. Raphael Sims was a native of Maryland and had served in the Mexican War. The Alabama was built for the Confederate States at Birkenhead, England and with an English crew and English equipment, was commanded by Sims. In 1863 and 1864, the Alabama destroyed much Federal shipping. On June 19, 1864, she was sunk by the Federal ship Kearsarge in a battle off Cherbourg. Claims against England for damages were made by the United States, and as a result, the Geneva Arbitration Court was created. Claims amounting to $15,500,000 were finally awarded. This case has much importance in the history of international law. End footnote. We moved into this house on the 20th of July. My husband was telegraphed to go to Charleston. General Jones sent for him. 
A part of his command is on the coast. The girls were at my house. Everything was in the utmost confusion. We were lying on a pile of mattresses in one of the front rooms while the servants were reducing things to order in the rear. All the papers are down on the President for this change of commanders, except the Georgia papers. Indeed, Governor Brown's constant complaints, I dare say, caused it. These and the rage of the Georgia people as Johnston backed down on them. Isabella soon came. She said she saw the Preston sisters pass her house, and as they turned the corner there was a loud and bitter cry. It seemed to come from the Hampton house. Both girls began to run at full speed. "'What is the matter?' asked Mrs. Martin. "'Mother, listen, that sounded like the cry of a broken heart,' said Isabella. "'Something has gone terribly wrong at the Prestons.' Mrs. Martin is deaf, however, so she heard nothing and thought Isabella fanciful. Isabella hurried over there and learned that they had come to tell Mrs. Preston that Willie was killed. Willie, his mother's darling. No country ever had a braver soldier, a truer gentleman, to lay down his life in her cause. July 26th. Isabella went with me to the bulletin board. Mrs. D., with the white linen, as usual, pasted on her chin, asked me to read aloud what was there written. As I slowly read on, I heard a suppressed giggle from Isabella. I know her way of laughing at everything, and tried to enunciate more distinctly, to read more slowly and louder, with more precision. As I finished and turned round, I found myself closely packed in by a crowd of Confederate soldiers eager to hear the news. They took off their caps, thanked me for reading all that was on the boards, and made way for me, cap in hand, as I hastily returned to the carriage which was waiting for us. Isabella proposed, "'Call out to them to give three cheers for Jeff Davis and his generals.' "'You forget, my child, that we are on our way to a funeral.' Found my new house already open hospitably to all comers. My husband had arrived. He was seated at a pine table on which someone had put a coarse red table cover, and by the light of one tallow candle was affably entertaining Edward Barnwell, Isaac Hayne, and Uncle Hamilton. He had given them no tea, however. After I had remedied that oversight, we adjourned to the moon-lighted piazza. By tallow candle-light and the light of the moon, we made out that wonderful smile of Teddy's which identifies him as Gerald Gray. We have laughed so at broken hearts, the broken hearts of the foolish love stories. But Buck now is breaking her heart for her brother Willie. Hearts do break in silence, without a word or a sigh. Mrs. Means and Mary Barnwell made no moan simply turned their faces to the wall and died. How many more that we know nothing of? When I remember all the true-hearted, the light-hearted, the gay and gallant boys who have come laughing, singing, and dancing in my way in the three years now past, how I have looked into their brave young eyes and helped them as I could in every way, and then saw them no more forever, how they lie stark and cold, dead upon the battlefield, or moldering away in hospitals or prisons, which is worse, I think if I consider the long array of those bright youths and loyal men who have gone to their death almost before my very eyes, my heart might break, too. Is anything worth it, this fearful sacrifice, this awful penalty we pay for war? Alan G. says Johnston was a failure. Now he will wait and see what Hood can do before he pronounces judgment on him. He liked his address to the army. It was grand and inspiring but everyone knows a general has not time to write these things himself. Mr. Kelly, from New Orleans, says Dick Taylor and Kirby Smith have quarreled. One would think we had a big enough quarrel on hand for one while already. The Yankees are enough and to spare. General Lovell says, Joe Brown, with his Georgians at his back, who importuned our government to remove Joe Johnston, they are scared now and wish they had not. In our democratic republic, if one rises to be its head, whomever he displeases takes a Turkish revenge and defiles the tombs of his father and mother, hence that his father was a horse thief, and his mother no better than she should be, his sisters barmaids and worse, his brothers Yankee turncoats and traitors. All this is hurled at Lincoln or Jeff Davis indiscriminately. August 2nd. Sherman again artillery parked and a line of battle formed before Atlanta. When we asked Brewster what Sam meant to do at Atlanta, he answered, 
Oh, oh, like the man who went. He says he means to stay there. Hope he may, that's all. Spent today with Mrs. McCord at her hospital. She is dedicating her grief for her son, sanctifying it, one might say, by giving up her soul and body, her days and nights, to the wounded soldiers at her hospital. Every moment of her time is surrendered to their needs. Today General Tolliver dined with us. He served with Hood at the Second Battle of Manassas and at Fredericksburg, where Hood won his Major General's spurs. On the battlefield, Hood, he said, has military inspiration. We were thankful for that word. All now depends on that army at Atlanta. If that fails us, the game is up. August 3rd. Yesterday was such a lucky day for my housekeeping in our hired house. Oh, ye kind Columbia folk! Mrs. Alex Taylor, nay, Hain, sent me a huge bowl of yellow butter and a basket to match of every vegetable in season. Mrs. Preston's man came with mushrooms freshly cut, and Mrs. Tom Taylor's with fine melons. Sent Smith and Johnson, my house servant and a carpenter from home, respectively, to the commissaries with our wagon for supplies. They made a mistake, so they said, and went to the depot instead, and stayed there all day. I needed a servant sadly in many ways all day long, but I hope Smith and Johnson had a good time. I did not lose patience until Harriet came in an omnibus, because I had neither servants nor horse to send to the station for her. Stephen Elliot is wounded, and his wife and father have gone to him. Six hundred of his men were destroyed in a mine, and part of his brigade taken prisoners. Stoneman and his raiders have been captured. This last fact gives a slightly different hue to our horizon of unmitigated misery. General L. told us of an unpleasant scene at the President's last winter. He called there to see Mrs. McLean. Mrs. Davis was in the room, and he did not speak to her. He did not intend to be rude. It was merely an oversight. And so he called again and tried to apologize, to remedy his blunder. But the President was inexorable, and would not receive his overtures of peace and goodwill. General L. is a New York man. Talk of the savagery of slavery, heavens! How perfect are our men's manners down here! How suave, how polished are they! Fancy one of them forgetting to speak to Mrs. Davis in her own drawing-room. August 6th. Archer came, a classmate of my husband's at Princeton. They called him Sally Archer then. He was so girlish and pretty. No trace of feminine beauty about this grim soldier now. He has a hard face, black-bearded and sallow, with the saddest black eyes. His hands are small, white, and well-shaped, his manners quiet. He is abstracted and weary-looking, his mind and body having been deadened by long imprisonment. He seemed glad to be here, and James Chesnut was charmed. Dear Sally Archer, he calls him cheerily, and the other responds in a far-off, faded kind of way. Hood and Archer were given the two Texas regiments at the beginning of the war. They were colonels, and Wigfall was their general. Archer's comments on Hood are, He does not compare intellectually with General Johnston, who is decidedly a man of culture and literary attainments, with much experience in military matters. Hood, however, has youth and energy to help counterbalance all this. He has a simple-minded directness of purpose always. He is awfully shy, and he has suffered terribly but then he has had consolations, such a rapid rise in his profession, and then his luck to be engaged to the beautiful Miss Blank. They tried Archer again and again on the heated controversy of the day, but he stuck to his text. Joe Johnston is a fine military critic, a capital writer, an accomplished soldier, as brave as Caesar in his own person, but cautious to a fault in manipulating an army. Hood has all the dash and fire of a reckless young soldier, and his Texans would follow him to the death. Too much caution might be followed easily by too much headlong rush. That is where the swing back of the pendulum might ruin us. August 10th. Today General Chesnut and his staff departed. His troops are ordered to look after the mountain passes beyond Greenville on the North Carolina and Tennessee quarter. Misery upon misery. Mobile is going as New Orleans went. Footnote. The Battle of Mobile Bay, won under Farragut, was fought on August 5, 1864. End footnote. 
those western men have not held their towns as we held and hold Charleston, or as the Virginians hold Richmond. And they call us a frill-shirt, silk-stocking chivalry, or a set of dandy Miss Nancys. They fight desperately in their bloody street brawls, but we bear privation and discipline best. August 14th. We have conflicting testimony. Young Wade Hampton, of Joe Johnston's staff, says Hood lost 12,000 men in the battles of the 22nd and 24th. But Brewster, of Hood's staff, says not 3,000 at the utmost. Footnote. On July 22nd, Hood made a sortie from Atlanta, but after a battle was obliged to return. End footnote. Now here are two people, strictly truthful, who tell things so differently. In this war, people see the same thing so oddly, one does not know what to believe. Brewster says when he was in Richmond, Mr. Davis said Johnston would have to be removed and Sherman blocked. He could not make Hardy full general, because, when he had command of an army, he was always importuning the War Department for a general-in-chief to be sent there over him. Polk would not do, brave soldier and patriot as he was. He was a good soldier, and would do his best for his country and do his duty under whomever was put over him by those in authority. Mr. Davis did not once intimate to him who it was that he intended to promote to the head of the Western Army. Brewster said today that this blow at Joe Johnston, cutting off his head, ruins the schemes of the enemies of the government. Wigfall asked me to go at once, and get Hood to decline to take this command, for it will destroy him if he accepts it. He will have to fight under Jeff Davis's orders. No one can do that now and not lose caste in the Western Army. Joe Johnston does not exactly say that Jeff Davis betrays his plans to the enemy, but he says he dares not let the President know his plans, as there is a spy in the War Office who invariably warns the Yankees in time. Consulting the government on military movements is played out. That's Wigfall's way of talking. Now, added Brewster, I blame the President for keeping a man at the head of his armies who treats the government with open scorn and contumely, no matter how the people at large rate this disrespectful general. August 19th. Began my regular attendance on the Wayside Hospital. Today we gave wounded men, as they stopped for an hour at the station, their breakfast. Those who are able to come to the table do so. The badly wounded remain in wards prepared for them, where their wounds are dressed by nurses and surgeons, and we take bread and butter, beef, ham, and hot coffee to them. One man had hair as long as a woman's, the result of a vow, he said. He had pledged himself not to cut his hair until peace was declared and our southern country free. Four made this vow together. All were dead but himself. One was killed in Missouri, one in Virginia and he left one at Kennesaw Mountain. This poor creature had had one arm taken off at the socket. When I remarked that he was utterly disabled and ought not to remain in the army, he answered quietly, I am of the first Texas. If old Hood can go with one foot, I can go with one arm, eh? How they quarreled and wrangled among themselves. Alabama and Mississippi all were loud for Joe Johnston, save and except the long-haired, one-armed hero who cried at the top of his voice, Oh, you all want to be kept in the trenches and to go on retreating, eh? Oh, if we had had a leader such as Stonewall, this war would have been over long ago. What we want is a leader, shouted a cripple. They were awfully smashed up, objects of misery, wounded, maimed, diseased. I was really upset and came home ill. This kind of thing unnerves me quite. Letters from the Army Grant's dogged stay about Richmond is very disgusting and depressing to the spirits. Wade Hampton has been put in command of the Southern Cavalry. A wayside incident. A pine box covered with flowers was carefully put upon the train by some gentlemen. Isabella asked whose remains were in the box. Dr. Gibbs replied, In that box lies the body of a young man whose family antedates the Bourbons of France. He was the last Count de Choiseul, and he has died for the South. Let his memory be held in perpetual remembrance by all who love the South. August 22nd. Hope I may never know a raid except from hearsay. Mrs. Eugene describes the one at Athens. The proudest and most timid of women were running madly in the streets, corsets in one hand, stockings in the other, 
Deshabille as far as it will go. Mobile is half taken. The railroad between us and Richmond has been tapped. Notes from a letter written by a young lady who is riding a high horse. Her fiancé, a maimed hero, has been abused. You say to me with a sneer, so you love that man. Yes, I do, and I thank God that I love better than all the world the man who is to be my husband. Proud of him, are you? Yes, I am, in exact proportion to my love. You say, I am selfish. Yes, I am selfish. He is my second self, so utterly absorbed am I in him. There is not a moment, day or night, that I do not think of him. In point of fact, I do not think of anything else. No reply was deemed necessary by the astounded recipient of this outburst of indignation, who showed me the letter and continued to observe, Did you ever? She seems so shy, so timid, so cold. Sunday Isabella took us to a chapel, Methodist, of course. Her father had a hand in building it. It was not clean, but it was crowded, hot, and stuffy. An eloquent man preached with a delightful voice and wonderful fluency, nearly eloquent, and at times nearly ridiculous. He described a scene during one of his sermons when beautiful young faces were turned up to me, radiant faces, though bathed in tears, moral rainbows of emotion playing over them, etc. He then described his own conversion, and stripped himself naked morally. All that is very revolting to one's innate sense of decency. He tackled the patriarchs. Adam, Noah, and so on down to Joseph, who was a man whose modesty and purity were so transcendent they enabled him to resist the greatest temptation to which fallen man is exposed. Fiddlesticks, that is played out, my neighbor whispered. Everybody gives up now that old Mrs. Pharaoh was forty. Mrs. Potiphar, you goose, and she was fifty. That solves the riddle. Shh! from the devout Isabella. At home met General Preston on the piazza. He was vastly entertaining. Gave us Darwin, Herodotus, and Livy. We understood him and were delighted, but we did not know enough to be sure when it was his own wisdom, or when wise saws and cheering words came from the authors of whom he spoke. August 23rd. All in a muddle, and yet the news, confused as it is, seems good from all quarters. There is a row in New Orleans. Memphis has been retaken. Two thousand prisoners have been captured at Petersburg. And a Yankee raid on Macon has come to grief. Footnote. General Forrest made his raid on Memphis in August of this year. End footnote. At Mrs. Izzard's met a clever Mrs. Calhoun. Mrs. Calhoun is a violent partisan of Dick Taylor. Says Taylor does the work, and Kirby Smith gets the credit for it. Mrs. Calhoun described the behavior of some acquaintance of theirs at Shreveport, one of that kind whose faith removes mountains. Her love for and confidence in the Confederate Army were supreme. Why not? She knew so many of the men who composed that dauntless band. When her husband told her New Orleans had surrendered to a foe whom she despised, she did not believe a word of it. He told her to pack up his traps as it was time for him to leave Shreveport. She then determined to run down to the levee and see for herself, only to find the Yankee gunboats having it all their own way. She made a painful exhibition of herself. First she fell on her knees and prayed. Then she got up and danced with rage. Then she raved and dashed herself on the ground in a fit. There was patriotism run mad for you. As I did not know the poor soul, Mrs. Calhoun's fine acting was somewhat lost on me, but the others enjoyed it. Old Edward Johnson has been sent to Atlanta against his will, and Archer has been made Major General, and contrary to his earnest request, ordered not to his beloved Texans, but to the Army of the Potomac. Mr. C. F. Hampton deplores the untimely end of McPherson. Footnote. General McPherson was killed before Atlanta during the sortie made by Hood on July 22nd. He was a native of Ohio, a graduate of West Point, and under Sherman commanded the Army of the Tennessee. In footnote. He was so kind to Mr. Hampton at Vicksburg last winter, and drank General Hampton's health then and there. Mr. Hampton has asked Brewster, if the report of his death prove a mistake, and General McPherson is a prisoner, that every kindness and attention be shown to him. General McPherson said at his own table at Vicksburg that General Hampton was the ablest general on our side. 
Grant can hold his own as well as Sherman. Lee has a heavy handful in the new Suaro. He has worse odds than anyone else, for when Grant has ten thousand slain, he has only to order another ten thousand, and they are there, ready to step out to the front. They are like the leaves of Valambrosa. End of chapter 18, part 1